Thank you. I really do feel I'm with my tribe um, here, and you'll sort of see the journey that led me to um, being very in a very different place to very much where you are now. Um, I want to thank, and that one of the one of the steps in that journey was Julie Baumgartner, um, who, when I was doing the research for the boy crisis, um, I wanted to find actual models of what was working, not just in theory, um, but in practice. And then I came across first things first got on the phone with Julie and I said, I need this data, I need it updated, I need boom, 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 this and that, and she supplied that um, to me, and I, I vetted, it, vetted it and found it was so, so much um, exactly what I wanted for the boy crisis, and also I have found myself not only creating it as, a, as putting it, the model there, um, but also talking about it in the media as well. So I really want us to thank Julie for the extraordinary work that she's done. <laughs> So I've taken seriously um, NARMI's mission um, about the mission statement that uh, the breakdown of marriages and families is a multi-sector problem with multi-sector solutions. And so I have not created a PowerPoint because I really wanted just to focus on exactly that issue and get everything in uh, to, uh, that, that is NARMI focused today. I won't be able to get everything in, but I'll be able to give you at least a little tip of the iceberg about the multi-sector dimensions of the problem and the uh, multi-sector solutions. You'll have a little bit of a sense as to uh, where you, can, where you with, who are doing the real um, hard um, hands-on work can maybe um, expand some of your operations. And, and understand exactly how important uh, your work is. Um, so I'm gonna do three things. I'm gonna do first this, a little bit of the, an intellectual presentation. So I'm extremely happy that you sort of got the group moving. Um, and second, um, I'm gonna do a, di a guided visual visualization with you on the life of your dad and allow you to do a paradigm shift about your, both you and your dad and what male, the male role is in the world that has, we have heard the exact opposite of um, in the last 50 years. And so, um, but I'd like to have you apply that to your own personal uh, life experience. And then I'll do um, a Q&A at the end with Troy. I, either I'll do a little bit by myself and then most of it with Troy or all of it with Troy depending on how the time goes. Um, so I just wanted to give you that, that background. You know, we're here in Orlando and in Orlando we had one of the world's worst mass shootings. Uh, and whenever we have a mass shooting, we ask the same set of questions. Um, are mass shootings due to poor family values? Are they due to mental illness? Are they due to violence in the media? Are they due to the availability of guns? Well, our daughters are exposed to the same family values, the same violence in the media, the same guns, and our daughters are not doing the shootings. Our sons are. So what is it with our sons? Is there a boy crisis? And if so, what's causing it? And what are the solutions? I want to give a first hint. See if you can pick up the hint in this. In the international PISA tests, Boys, uh, we, the reports, the findings were that boys fall behind girls in almost every academic area in more than the 60 largest developed nations. The hint is in the word developed. I began to see that developed nations have solved one problem, survival. And as they did this, they allowed two new freedoms that created two new sets of problems. Developed nations typically allow more permission both for divorce and for children to be born to unmarried mothers. So in the US today, as you probably know, women under 30 who have children, 53% of them have children without being married. Now, a good percentage of them do not even live with a man but even among the smaller percentage that do live with a man, 40% of the children do not have consistent contact with their fathers after the age of three. That's of that smaller group that is living with a man. The group that is not living with a man, very tiny percentage of them have consistent long-term contact with their dads. Now, I just want to make it clear before I go on that not all children of divorce 
or unmarried um, mothers have significant problems. Children whose fathers re do remain significantly involved, what I will call for the, this presentation, dad enriched children often do only slightly less well than children in an intact family. However, children with minimal or no father involvement, what I would call dad deprived children, experience problems in more than 70 different areas. You create the nightmare of a parent and you will find that in these children. The, all of these 70 are explained in the boy crisis. You'll be happy to know I will not be going over all 70 in this presentation. <laughs> um, girl, I want to put, spend a minute with girls of divorce. Um, girls of divorce and unmarried parents who are dad deprived also do suffer in most of these 70 areas. But they suffer less than boys. So what I, because this is a sophisticated audience, I want to give you some hard data on this right now. Um, the most important single indicator of long-term health and longevity is telomeres, the existence of the longer telomeres in your, um, in your cells. When the, tel when the telomeres in our cells shrink, that is the strongest single indicator of a shorter life expectancy, even by the age of nine. So here's the important info. Children who, by the age of nine, have had insignificant minimal father involvement or no father involvement, on the average, boy and girl put together, on the average, they already, by the age of nine, have 14% shorter telomeres, predicting, according to the National Association of Science, an average of about a 14% shorter life expectancy already by the age of nine not having significant father involvement. But here's the powerful uh, piece of statistic that's a metaphor for what happens for boys versus girls. Boys compared to girls who do not have significant father involvement by the age of nine, their telomeres are yet again 40% shorter than their sisters. So yes, Lack of father involvement hurts both boys and girls. We'll see increasingly why it hurts boys even more, why boys are truly the more fragile sex when it comes to a lack of emotional connection, in part, as you probably could guess, because boys, uh, if to the degree they're trained to be a man, is the degree to which they're trained to disconnect from their emotional connections, and therefore they're more in need of it. We just have a much better mask to put on to, to, to not let anybody know that we're in need of it. I ultimately defined nine causes of the boy crisis, but each cause was magnified by, nine, by dad deprivation. So for example, one cause is the current purpose void for boys. That is, in the past, boys learned two rigid senses of purpose. You could either be a warrior and risk dying in war, or you could be a sole breadwinner, whether or not you were oriented that way. If you were going to be expected to get married, have love in your life, and have children in your life, have a wife that admired you or respected you, you'd better darn well earn a living. And, and, and in the old days, you were expected to do all of the, you know, the sole breadwinner work. Fortunately, um, women are relieving men of that burden, but we'll see what the positives and the negatives are about that in a second. Today, these rigid senses of purpose are no longer prescribed to boys. So boys have what I call a purpose void. Boys' purpose void is one of the causes of the boy crisis. However, for dad-deprived boys, we have the purpose void magnified by the dad void. So for this boy, there is neither a, cult a cultural role model of purpose, however rigid that might have been in the past, or is there a paternal role model? And so that's two of the reasons why boys are, in this, in this group of boys, of lack of father role model, 
that's what, two of the reasons why every cause is magnified by the, the dad deprivation. Instead, the purpose for it has become like an empty garbage pail that's filled with a poison called shame. Let me explain. Shame at being a carrier of a disease, a disease called toxic masculinity. And I want to share with you a real life story of a real life boy who at the age of 14 uh, wrote this slam poem of which I'm going to read a little bit of it to you. Recently, I became a man. Had happened the first time women avoided me on the sidewalk. She glanced back and she changed direction, crossing the street. Her footsteps taught me the danger of my own hands. In that moment, I finally understood Peter Pan. I want to stay a boy, not become a man, because a man, as I now knew, was a mix between a father, a brother, and an attacker, mostly the attacker. Feel Royce's shame, the danger of my own hands, at his male identity being one of mostly an attacker, at his conclusion, I want to stay a boy. At the very moment that a boy has the greatest purpose void in history, and therefore a much greater need for a dad to help him discover his purpose, millions of boys find themselves without a dad to guide that discovery. And without a dad to help him redirect his shame when he feels his hormones make him yearn for her breast, even as he fears she may be repulsed by his cum. How does he direct this sex drive, which is just surging throughout his body at age 10, 12, 14, 16? Does he take a cue from the best-selling female fantasies of what women really want? The best-selling one of all times is what? Gone with the wind, in which a woman is, who is protesting is swept off her feet, uh, dragged up the stairway uh, against her, her, her will, and then, they, and then the result of that, him taking charge, him taking over, him being a leader, is they have mad, passionate love. Well, that might be a hint. On the other hand, maybe he should update his fantasies. What do women read most recently? Well, the best-selling book for females recently is, let's see that one called Fifty Shades of, yes, Gray, not John Gray, but this gray, uh, slightly <laughs> different Gray. <laughs> John just wants me to make that clear. <laughs> Um, and maybe he should ask for his birthday for, from his parents a new set of whips for his maybe sweet, sweet 16 party. Um, and so that he can whip uh, more effectively as is, um, as is in the female fantasy. Or on the other hand, does he not reach out at all lest he do it the wrong way at the wrong time and become one more predator on the hashtag me too list? Now mind you, this gender, this guy speaking is a boy. Is he more or less mature than a girl his age? Less mature, so we're asking the less mature sex who knows less about females than females know about him, in many respects less about sex in its larger context of romance and, and interpersonal communication than girls know about, uh, about sex. And we're asking that less mature sex to still be responsible for taking the sexual initiatives. Girls and women have the option of taking the sexual initiatives. Boys and men not only have the, they have the expectation, but they also have to pay for it for the most part. And, so the, and, the, and the closer he gets to being a possible father, the more he will be expected to possibly pay, especially, especially among the women who expect him to be a dad. They don't want a dad a male on the unemployment ride line reading the boy crisis um, um, on the unemployment line. That's not okay. So what does he turn to? Instead of getting real life rejection from girls or women or not knowing what to do, he turns to what? Porn. 250 million free video porns. Just Google it anytime. What is porn to your son? It's access to a variety of attractive women without fear of rejection at a price he can afford. 
even if it does damage his brain, deaden his dopamine, and magnify his shame. For boys with involved dads, or dad and rich boys though, there is good news. The purpose void means that there is more flexibility of purpose for boys. Boys don't have to prepare themselves to be disposable, to be valued as a man, to be called a hero. There is more permission for a boy than ever, a boy with, involved with dads, um, to discover himself, not to have to become a human doing like his grandpa, but to be free through parental guidance to become a human being. And boys with involved fathers indeed do have role models to help them discover the way to combine both what fulfills them, what is in tune with their unique self, combined with what does it take to make a living. That seems like a passable sentence. But a dad's guidance is often helpful because most men know what very few men say, which is that the more fulfilling a career, the less it pays. Many of you know that. Hence, starving artist. Or 99% of actors in Hollywood have actually the same name, waiter. <laughs> that is, most dads know that it's all too li likely that when you follow your bliss, it's the money you'll miss. His dad knows that if his son should either wish him to be a dad or is attracted to a woman who wishes to be a mom, that few women, as I mentioned a minute ago, are reading, I'm okay, you're okay, on the unemployment line. A few women want men who are reading that on the unemployment line. While girls who are dad deprived also suffer in most of those 70 areas, the women's movement did do a really major positive service for girls and women. It helped our daughters by creating the options for our daughters, for what I call the era of the multi-option woman. Expanding the options of middle-class married women from the old raised children to three options, raise children full-time, raise money full-time, or do some combination of the above. But no one prepared our sons for anything but, well, they, no, no, wait a minute, they did have three options too. Option one was work full time, if they were gonna be a father in a middle class family. Option two is work full time. And option three is work full time, or work two jobs, or work harder at the job you're working at. Earning more is not male privilege. It is male expectation. It is pressure on males to do it, whatever it takes to be less fulfilled that earns enough to support the number of children your wife and you have together effectively enough with a margin for error consistently and dependably over the course of my life. My father fought with me against being a writer saying, yes, your first book did well, but you can't do that consistently and dependably. That's what your family needs. Girls may suffer less from dad deprivation, in part because a girl raised primarily by a mom has two rudders to move effectively through life. The first, the first rudder is a female role model. And the second rudder is a culture that today is telling girls, you don't just have to be female raised children, you can be female raised children, raise money, or do some combination of both. And so with that cultural permission to be flexible, plus a mother to guide her toward which options are most suitable toward her, she feels a great deal more security. In contrast, dad deprived boys have no rudders. They have no male role model, and no culture saying, you go boy, discover your unique self. The future is male. Not even the future is also male. Not, is he, not even the future is children. But they hear, they hear the future is female. Some good news for boys. While millions of boys who are, uh, are dad deprived, millions of other boys 
are enriched by dads who are more involved than, I, than dads were in my generation and certainly in my grandparents' generation. Those boys are truly dad enriched. My son-in-law is involved with his son morning, noon, and night, cut back his work when the son was born, even though they live in a trailer just to be able to have more time with his son. I predict this gap between dad-deprived boys and dad-enriched boys will lead to the biggest gap in history between our future leaders and boys in crisis. OK, I promised a multi-sector presentation. This requires us to understand more deeply how we translate this into policy. And that requires understanding the answer to four questions at the very at least. First, exactly what are the consequences of dad deprivation that lays the foundation for boys who hurt to hurt us, as in the mass shootings? Second, exactly what is dad-style parenting, and why does it help children? You can have a dad, as we'll talk about in a few minutes, and for him not to have dad-style parenting, and the children will still have problems. Third, what is the difference between raising our sons successfully in the past versus raising our sons successfully for their future? Or what is the transition that needs to take place between traditional masculinity, or what I call heroic intelligence, heroic, H-E-R-O-I-C intelligence, and the future of the healthy boy, which is the development of healthy intelligence or health intelligence. So there's a huge gap between heroic intelligence and health intelligence that we must have an understanding of if we're to understand how to raise our sons successfully. And fourth, what is the single best solution to the boy crisis, if I had to name one? But before I start this, let me be very personal for a minute. Um, I'm going to be sharing findings with you that none of these findings came easily for me. What was not mentioned by Julie is that I was on the board of directors of the National Organization for Women in New York City for three years. I was the world's leading male feminist. I spoke all around the world on behalf of women's issues. Um, and, and when I started to find how children do best after divorce, I, and I started to say that, gee, fathers are really important, I ran into problems. I ran into problems with now on two issues. They wanted the freedom for mom to decide what was best for children after divorce. Second, they wanted the freedom for a woman to bear children without being married or without a dad. And I, these people who felt that I was like God's gift to the women's movement started looking at me with very different eyes. I was cut off of national programs that I was doing with Gloria Steinem. Those programs were never aired when I started to air this type of thing, never invited back. I began to have fear because I was doing very well financially. I was doing very well popularity-wise. And yet I also began to see that if I was going to be honest, that my research was not telling me what now wanted me to say. I support women's freedom. And when a woman or a man makes a free decision to have children, she or he makes a free decision to put what benefits the children first. We'll see what happens to boys when those two freedoms lead to dad deprivation. And you'll get a sense why I'm no longer speaking at NOW conventions or at college campuses, which are usually the extension of now conventions, <laughs> and why I, almost made a free why I almost made a free decision to become a starving artist. <laughs> <laughs> but because this is tough stuff, and I want you to be here with me for it, I'm going to ask you to take a little break with me and stand up, if you would, and to stand with um, and turn to your right this, this way. 
and stand within arm's length of the person in front of you. So everybody try to have a person in front of you. And if you can um, close in among tables and get to somebody in front of you, that's great. So keep, keep walking and moving until you find somebody in front of you. And with your, with your arms extended, uh, yes, yes, absolutely. Um, and would you come in and, um, Ju Julie needs a little bit of support there. <laughs> okay, now I'm gonna ask you with your arms extended to give uh, the person in front of you a, um, a, a nice shoulder rub. <laughs> See, this is what happens when you bring in somebody from California. <laughs> um, the person who's being rubbed, say harder, softer. I heard somebody say lower, no, no fair. <laughs> I'll now ask you to turn around and rub the shoulders of the person in front of you. Harder, softer, but not lower. <laughs> Okay, give yourselves a big hand. <laughs> I heard somebody say, more of this, less of that speech. <laughs> So here goes. The consequences of a boy being dad and rich versus dad deprived. Boys who are dad and rich do better in math, science, and in most other subjects, even when they come from poorer schools, than boys coming from excellent schools without a dad being involved. The implications of that are enormous. Is it the schools that are the problem? Or is it the families that uh, feed the children into schools that are the problem? Dad and rich boys have less ADHD. We'll see exactly how much less in a minute. They have more empathy. We'll see why in a minute. They are more likely to be assertive, less likely to be aggressive. This is dad and rich boys. They are more likely to achieve academically be happy socially, and be healthy both mentally and physically. In contrast, dad deprivation is the greatest single predictor of a boy committing what? Suicide. Boys in their early 20s commit suicide at six times the rate of girls. Dad deprivation is the single biggest predictor of taking drugs and becoming drug addicted. Dad deprived boys are much more likely to drink excessively. They're more likely, you, you could probably guess, to be bullies and also more likely to be bullied. The bully and the bullied have similar family backgrounds and similar personalities. They're more likely to, much more likely to drop out of school, to be alienated, to be depressed, to be rudderless, to be delinquent. The result, we have thousands of women's centers in the United States, but we have a special name for our men's centers. Any prisons, exactly. But more precisely, prisons are not just centers for boys and men, they are centers for dad-deprived boys and men. These boys are hurting. Sadly, when boys who hurt stop with helping them, hurting themselves, as, like, as with suicide, we respond with a cultural shrug. But boys who hurt also hurt who? Others. Us, others, exactly. The great majority of mass shootings are not just by boys, but by dad-deprived boys. 
And a study, and this next sentence is amazing. A study of ISIS recruits has uncovered that ISIS recruits are almost all dad what? Deprived. Not only the boys, but that smaller percentage of girls that are ISIS recruits are also dad deprived. This is so unknown that the three female sociologist researchers that researched this didn't even ask this question of the dad recruits in prison that they had access to, but they had it volunteered to them so often that they decided to go back and systematically ask the question, which tells you a great deal, both aspects of that. Ironically, the availability of AR-15 style assault weapons is making us care more about boys because they make it easier for boys who hurt to hurt us. Second, exactly what is dad style parenting that I referred to briefly and why does it help children? I, I discuss in the boy crisis approximately 10 differences between dad style parenting and mom style parenting. However, I can't, <laughs> don't have time for this there, all of that there, but so let me take one that I think will help illustrate a number, uh, roughhousing. Many mothers see a roughhousing dad as just one more child she has to monitor. <laughs> She's sure that sooner or later the roughhousing will go too far and one of the children will end up crying or hitting their head on an end table or hitting, hitting their heads with each other. What percentage chance is she, uh, is she likely to be right or wrong? She's right. 99% of time, right. Um, and, and then mom is angry at herself, feeling guilty for not fulfilling her responsibility for proactively protecting the children, saying, I know the children are having fun. I don't want to interrupt that. I don't want to interfere with the dad style parenting. OK, I'll, I'll, I'll lay my hands off. And then, oh my god, exactly what I thought was going to happen. Why didn't I know that? Why didn't I speak up? That type of thing. And so the mom feels guilty. Um, For, ex uh, for example, let's say Johnny is having um, fun uh, and has a younger brother, Brad, and a younger sister, Chris Krista, and they're play wrestling uh, with their dad. And the dad is throwing them on the couch, and they're jumping back on his back. Uh, he's in horsey style. Um, in their excitement, um, Johnny pushes aside Brad, and Brad blocks out his sister, Krista, and Brad pushes Johnny back, and Krista starts crying, and mom is beside herself. That's a typical roughhousing scene. Dads, dip, dads typically don't study chapters in books on the benefits of roughhousing or dad style parenting, so they cannot share with mom what I'm about to share with you. And moms can't hear what dads don't say. But here's what's happening that dad doesn't say. The roughhousing allows dad to create a bond with the children. And now dad has and often does use the leverage of that bond to tell Johnny and Brad that if they push their brother or sister aside so hard, the wrestling will stop. So they continue wrestling, though, after the warning. And then, the, with the excitement returning, the promises of the children to be considerate and empathetic toward each other's needs disappears. And Brad pushes his sister or brother again. Dad typically says, OK, Brad, I warned you, no more wrestling tonight. And so Brad is not the only one punished. Brad's lack of willingness to think about his sisters and brothers also punishes his sisters and brothers, which creates a group um, effort to make sure that there's empathy in that little group of the three kids. What dad has just done is to use the leverage of his bond to enforce a boundary that has less resentment attached to it than it would be by an autocratic parent just saying, don't do this or don't do that, because the kids want to feel that bond and they want to get back and have more excitement. Dad is basically a roller coaster. He creates an enormous amount of excitement, but the children hope that it you know, pretty much depends on the fact that there's safety um, at the end of that excitement. Um, Dad could not explain in words to the children what too pushing too hard means. No one can explain what too hard means in words. He can only let them experience it. If he didn't return to the roughhousing after the, 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 the warning, the kids would never have experienced what too far is. And so it's the returning to the roughhousing 
that allows the kids to test out what the boundaries are. If he did, um, so to dad, crying, their, crying or hitting the, the children hitting their head against each other up to a point and within reason helps the kids experience what going too far is, not just hear it in words. Few dads explain to mom that what the data shows is that roughhousing helps children know when being assertive becomes being aggressive. It teaches them what psychologists call, call emotional intelligence under fire. Now another difference between dad style and mom style parenting is the difference between boundary enforcement and boundary setting. Once dad warns them, he knows that if he was to repeat the warning, that the children would ignore him in the future. Get that. If he's to repeat the warning, the children will ignore him in the future when they, he does a future warning because they're caught, when they're so caught up in excitement, the fun of pushing and shoving um, outweighs uh, uh, the fear of a parent repeating a warning. So when their excitement leads to them ignoring the warning, he typically says, okay, no more roughhousing tonight, and he stops. It's enough to get the point across. Because the children feel bonded to dad by roughhousing and they want more, they are upset and they do protest. But when he enforces, he just stays with it. And mom looks at this and she says, she's disconcerted because she notices over a period of time that dad only has to say things once. <laughs> you get the point. Mm -hmm. By the boundary being enforced and the promise of more fun, dad has just taught the children two of the most important lessons in life that the data shows emanate from the blend of boundary enforcement and roughhousing combined. Number one is empathy. And this group knows better than most the importance of empathy. How to think about their sisters and brothers' needs, not just their own needs. And how to do this not just rationally, but when they're carried away with excitement. So studies I document in the boy crisis show that the more time children spend with dads, the more empathetic the children are likely to be. The less empathetic parent Dad creates circumstances that creates greater amounts of empathy in children, both girls and boys, but especially boys. Second, postpone gratification. When mom repeats her warning, giving the child yet another chance, usually out of empathy for the child or the circumstances of the day, the child learns to continue doing what he or she wants to do, not what she or he has to do. That is, the child fails to learn postponed gratification, and postponed gratification is the single biggest predictor of success. As originally discovered in the famous marshmallow experiment that I'm sure many of you are familiar with uh, by Michelle at Stanford. What dad has done, but doesn't say, is to teach the children how to focus on what they need to do to get what they want to do, to be sensitive to others' needs in order to get more of roughhousing. A boy without the discipline of postponed gratification often slides down this terrible slippery slope that I'm about to describe to you. Instead of being able to finish homework or rehearsing for a sport or rehearsing for a play, whatever he has his gift in, he gets too distracted with texts or the latest video game an offer by his friend to play the latest video game. So he feels ashamed of himself, depressed, escaping at the end of a needle or by addiction to video games or porn. He doesn't feel the pride from his parents, from teachers and females and males at school don't pay as much attention to him. They don't seem to elect him to things. He don't, doesn't seem to feel like he has the approval. When it comes to boy and girl time, very few girls are interested in dating losers. So he feels like a loser and feel, fears like any relationship with a girl is likely to end um, badly, and usually it does. 
In worst case scenarios, he commits, he not only becomes depressed, in worst case scenarios, he commits suicide. Or in the very worst case scenarios, he is so angry at being invisible and having his sweetness and his sensitivity and his intelligence not paid attention to by the teachers, by his peers, by anybody at school, uh, that he shoots the people at school, making them notice him for one time in his life and wish they'd paid attention to him for what he was yearning because they wouldn't have then had to lose their friends. The dad-mom boundary setting versus boundary enforcement gap is typical, but it's not universal. Moms can set and enforce boundaries, and we saw that the dad of Omar Mateen, who did the Orlando shooting, he was present, but every time Omar Mateen was caught by the police or punished by the school, they, Omar Mateen's dad played the role of protector, said, no, you can't do that with my boy. I'll sue you. I'll get back at you. And so he protect, He didn't allow, he didn't exhibit dad-style parenting. Typically, when a kid gets arrested, mom will say, oh, this is terrible. Is there any way you can let him off a little bit sooner? And dads will say to mom, no, let him be in jail. He needs to stay in prison overnight. He did that. Let him take responsibility for it and let him see what the price is now rather than repeat it over and over again. Omar Mateen did not do that. So being a dad is not magical. It is not a panacea. And being a mom doesn't mean you cannot do it boundary enforcement. You can. On average, though, with this gap between boundary enforcement and boundary setting, there's an ADHD gap. 30% of children living only or primarily with their mom had problems with concentration or ADHD versus 15% who live primarily or only with their dads. I think you get a little bit of a sense as to the different styles of parenting and how that is accomplished. Bedtimes. Although a mom is more likely to set an early bedtime, single moms are more than three times as likely as single dads to let younger kids get away with late or irregular bed bedtimes. Children, though, who do especially well don't have a single mom or a single dad. Children who do especially well don't have children um, being primarily raised by one parent and the other parent just coming back after he, he does his breadwinner role. Children who do especially well have parents who engage in what I call checks and balance parenting, respecting the positive contributions of both the mother and the father, the propensities of mothers to protect, to nurture, to make sure that that Bad hitting of the heads doesn't go too far, so it becomes a concussion. <laughs> and it's the parents that communicate about both of those together that have children that do, I have found, the best. All of this opens the door to a number of questions I'm not going to have a chance to answer before we do the end, but I'll put them in your mind in case these are your questions and you want to ask them toward, at the end. Uh, number one, is what can be done in the event of a divorce? How, how do you minimize damage to the children? And there, is a, there are four things you can do. What can single moms do to facilitate male role models? And which ones work best? And what schools can do to facilitate male role models? And what works best? But because this group is multi-sector and it's desirous to respond, let me first introduce a pivotal paradigm shift that's crucial to understanding the difference between raising our sons successfully in the past versus raising our sons successfully for the future, no matter who the parent is. Historically, boys achieved purpose by being trained to become disposable. Whether in war or at work, in war, the disposability is obvious. At work, if he's a working class man, it is, being among the it is being among the hazardous professions, or what I call the death professions, such as being a coal miner or a long distance trucker, all of which are 90 to 100% males. If he's an executive, he risks, as the Japanese call it, karoshi. Karoshi means, in Japanese, death at the desk or death at overwork. 
That's expected of executives. Almost every female in Japan and China wants to marry in, um, what they call in Japan a salaried man or a man who's got a good job, especially if she wishes to become a, um, uh, a mother. In brief, if he's to be respected, especially if he's to be a dad, he learns to feel an obligation to earn money that often someone else spends while he dies sooner. I just wanted to be a little lightweight there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, men, learn, men learn to define power as feeling obligated to earn money that often someone else spends while he, he dies sooner. And to not only not say that, but to not even know themselves well enough to think that. So if you say that to a man, you'll notice he has to think for a while before he says, I'll be darned. Heroic intelligence we're going to introduce is basically socialization for a short life. Health intelligence is socialization for a long life. So here's the fascinating thing. How, we, how is it that we've just managed to persuade boys and men to be disposable and simultaneously convince them that they have male privilege? Are they that stupid? They, we do it by a chorus of social bribes that intersects with a part of our brain called the rostral cingulate zone. The chorus of social bribes might be called the sirens of social bribes. They seduce our sons into being, call, being called heroes. So one of the sirens in this chorus may be dad. For example, at a football game, I've heard dads exclaiming, that's my son who got that touchdown, with no consciousness of the boy standing next to him is also his son, who I interview later and says, Dad never was that excited about me. It turns out, Mom says, tells me, that he was sensitive, he was caring, he was altruistic. But that sensitivity, caring, and altruism didn't get anybody to go, first in 10, be more sensitive again. <laughs> Excuse that. <laughs> The, what the father has just engaged in is what I call son dropping. Wanting others to give him credit as a parent for the achievements of the son. On the surface, it does work for the son being praised. And it hurts for the son being neglected. But I said on the surface, it works for the son being praised. Beneath the surface, it bribes the son via praise to associate being loved with being disposable. Beneath the surface, it bribes the sun via the praise to associate being loved with being disposable. That is the evolutionary shift that we, you, the practitioners, need to be bringing to the world. Another siren in the chorus of social bribes for male disposability is the cheerleaders that I sort of imitated in a second ago. Whether it's the cheerleaders yelling, hit him again, hit him again, harder, harder, rather than be careful now, we care more about your safety than a touchdown. <laughs> the cheerleaders don't say, here's a safer way to run that play. Or another siren of the social bribe in the chorus of social bribes for male disposability is schools. Few schools ask, how, how about flag football? And I've never heard Child Protective Services subpoena the Board of Education with your high school's football program is being investigated as taxpayer supported child abuse before the age of consent. Multi-sector. As for the boy himself, he notices that if he loses that position on the team, is the cheerleader still cheering? Yes, she's still cheering. 
but she's not cheering for him, she's cheering for his replaceable part. The next body in number seven uniform. What your son unconsciously absorbs is what I call the hero paradox. He learns to value himself by not valuing himself. He notices that the more he risks disposability, the more he will be considered a member of the elite, the elite Navy SEALs, the elite Special Forces, an astronaut, CIA Special Op. The hero paradox is so deeply ingrained in his psyche that he will forfeit his life even when there is no pay. Thus, 76% of American firefighters receive neither bonus nor pay. They are called volunteer firefighters. Almost 100% are which gender? Men. The pay of vol the volunteer firefighters is praise, it's respect, it's purpose, it's social bribes. The potential to graduate a hero if he saves somebody else's life, the knowledge that if in the process he loses his own life, his status as a hero only increases. When he dies, he is not a victim, he is a hero. But he is also a victim, a victim of social bribes if he hasn't made that decision consciously. We've developed an unconscious invest investment in social bribes that put our sons in jeopardy so that we may live. Or put our sons, sons in jeopardy so that we may just live better, more comfortably. Look up here for a moment. Look around this auditorium. Think of the members of the death professions who risked their lives to build this auditorium. The young man who became one of the loggers who cut the wood in this building, or the driver of the 18-wheeler who brought the logs over here, also one of the most dangerous professions, the 18-wheeler truck driver. He brought that truck over bridges, often built by welders, another of the most hazardous professions. Finally arriving at this construction site at which this auditorium was built by construction workers who die at the rate of one every workday hour in the United States. The best solution to the boy crisis? The crisis for boys can best be solved by communication training for parents. If the biggest cause of the boy crisis is dad deprivation, do we prevent dad deprivation by legislation? No, I think we prevent it by communication. It is poor communication that leads to divorces that are likely to lead to dad deprivation. And when men and women can't communicate effectively, potential moms feel they'd rather have a child in their life than a man in their life. So they have a child without being married. And even if they live with a man, they soon split. And we soon have government-supported dad-deprived children. So the first solution is parental communication. If there is to be any government program, it must pass the litmus test of supporting family togetherness, not paying money to moms if they get rid of dads. For example, training parents to communicate and second, Helping, as a second example of a program, is helping moms and dads understand the checks and balance parenting that I referred to before. Third is to change the fundamental cultural message to our sons as future fathers. Instead of saying, Uncle Sam needs you to kill or be killed, saying, Uncle Sam needs you to love your family and be loved by your family. We need you to be a father warrior, to overcome the social bribes that trap you into the father's catch-22. The father's catch-22 being that you can be a father by loving your family, by being away from the love of your family. A fourth program, 
is empathic communication skills need to be part of every elementary school's curriculum. I said elementary school's curriculum. Caveat, schools that train our kids to simultane, uh, need to simultaneously train their parents because if they don't, the kids learn good communication skills and then they go home to parents that are arguing and becoming defensive and what happens to the kids, they lose respect for their parents and that destabilizes the family. So it happens, has to happen both ways and simultaneously. Then one more solution will become one more problem. One of the ways your sons can be a leader in this process to, is to become a teacher of boys. A teacher who understands that boys respond best when they are pushed, when they are stretched. As comes naturally via competition, think about having communications competitions with communications trophies or caring competitions with boys telling verified stories of what they learned while they were caring for their younger sibling or a grandparent who was on his or her deathbed. Or debate teams in which the winners are the ones to best articulate the perspective of their opponents. Think about Republicans and Democrats doing this with each other. <laughs> Then it's his emotional intelligence that makes him a winner. In brief, the future offers your son the mission to be a pioneer of new heroic intelligence, one that leads with emotional and health intelligence. The less women are dependent on a husband to provide money, the more they will select a son, a boy, a, a male for his emotional intelligence. While marriage is the best way to ensure that a boy has an involved dad, your marriage will not inspire him to marry if he feels you are legally married but psychologically divorced. Nor will it inspire him if he senses that his parents have suffered through staying together until the children got older. Psychologically divorced parents who are just biding time until their children's graduation, often feel like their parents are, uh, are in a minimum security prison marriage. It's depressing for the parents and it provokes anxiety in the children. So I need to dig deeper with you. What creates this marital failure, whether legally or psychologically? Many couples blame the failure of their marriages on money, children, or lack of sex. I would claim that a happy marriage is less about money, children, or lack of sex than about how we communicate about money, children, and the lack of sex. So, if everyone wants to communicate well, why isn't everybody doing it? For starters, virtually every couple faces a love dilemma. While falling in love is biologically natural, sustaining love is biologically unnatural. The challenge of sustaining love begins with the Achilles heel of humans. The Achilles heel of humans is our inability to handle personal criticism from a loved one without becoming defensive, especially if that criticism is given badly. And for most of us, all criticism from loved ones is considered given badly. <laughs> <laughs> Why, though, doesn't our love overcome our defensiveness? Because the more deeply we love, the more our partner's criticism hurts, the more fragile we feel. So when our loved one's criticism increases our fragility, we may respond with defensiveness and anger. But our partner, not aware that our anger is our vulnerability's mask, repeat that one, 
Our anger is our vulnerability's mask. Our partner, not aware that our anger is our vulnerability's mask, is both blinded by our to, is both blinded to our vulnerability, which would, if she was she or he was not blinded to it, would soften their heart. And they're also simultaneously intimidated by the anger itself. So our partner responds by not criticizing us again many times, but by instead walking on eggshells rather than sharing his or her feelings and concerns. Slowly our passions flower wilts. Raising children and the money to support them leaves us too fatigued to communicate, but too dependent to divorce. So we remain legally married, but psychologically divorced in that minimum security prison marriage. Therefore, despite spending all my life speaking on trying to get men and women to understand each other and doing exercises that, that help people, that facilitate, I found that even when I did my most powerful exercises that allowed men and women to understand each other, when they had an argument, everything was forgotten because the hurt of the criticism um, led them to respond defensively and to, um, and to often destroy each other. And the more I taught them that made them love each other, the more vulnerable they felt, so it didn't change that type of dynamic. So here's what I've been doing with my recent life. Most of my recent, recent life's work has been inventing a work, what I call a workaround to the hard wiring of defensiveness that screws up marriages. Since defensiveness is biologically natural, when somebody criticized us from a different kinship network or tribe, we picked up the cues that that might be an enemy. So we got up our defenses to protect ourselves against the enemy, or better yet, we killed the enemy before the enemy killed us. The same thing we do in marriage. And so, I started to realize that that's biologically hardwired and that I had to work and spent about 20 years working on a way around that, biologically hardwire, that biological hardwiring. So I teach couples to create a caring and sharing time of just two hours per week when prior to hearing their partner's concerns, they alter their biologically natural mindset with a six-step meditation that's all built on exercises that we do in the workshop to have them apply that meditation to their life that allows them to temporarily do something that's biologically unnatural, to temporarily associate feeling criticized with an opportunity to be more deeply loved. It is only during that two-hour period that they are asked to alter their natural state of defensiveness and temporarily associate the criticism with being loved. The couples are then taught to both create and sustain a conflict-free zone during the remaining 166 hours of the week. These are just two components of what I call the art and discipline of love. I encourage you that whether you achieve this by this method or another method, that to build into your programs this communication method to begin to introduce it into grammar schools, not just high schools, where kids have already had the wounding of being bullied or bullying. Denmark is already doing this. I share a number of programs that are being done around the world where it has been done successfully. I don't have time to elaborate, but if, if my couple's communication method interests you, either talk with me afterwards or just connect with me by email. Um, and I'm, I'm doing my last one on the East Coast for the next year. Um, uh, at Omega Institute in Rhinebeck, New York at the end of September. So um, just again, just check my website out for that if you wish. We've seen that as developed, so I want to conclude by saying that we have seen that as developed nations solved one problem, survival, they allowed new freedoms that have created new problems. And the boy crisis grew in the fertile soil of families without fathers. We have seen but a dozen or so of the more than 70 ways that dad-deprived boys are indeed deprived. We've seen that boys who hurt, hurt us. And we have seen that we haven't cared about boys being hurt until 
they hurt us. We have seen that children who do especially well have parents who engage in checks and balance parenting, respecting the, con con the positive contributions of each parent's style and communicating non-defensively as they apply both parents' styles to any given situation their children face. We've seen that the absence of fathers creates the presence of government. But I've also posited that government programs that call forth boys to be father warriors by letting them, both our sons and daughters know exactly how dads are not just wanted but needed will inspire our boys to fill their purpose void with a new sense of purpose, not by killing or being killed, but by loving and being loved, not by heroic intelligence motivated by social bribes to a shorter life, but by health intelligence motivated by valuing themselves to live a longer life. In the past, our sons have experienced the hero paradox, to value themselves by not valuing themselves. It will take more than the government to reverse that inheritance. It will take the leadership of every relationship and marriage educator in this room, re-educating millions of parents, thousands of teachers, and hundreds of associations of therapists. Although our sons are damaged even more than our daughters by the loss of family or father, every boy who is a failure to launch leaves a woman without a man who is worthy of her love. When it comes to men and women, it isn't about oppressor versus oppressed. We are all in the same family boat. Whenever only one sex wins, both sexes lose. My experience with now taught me that sometimes what, quote, progressives advocate is not progressive. Sometimes what evolves over thousands of years in the past is also what is best for our future. Thank you. Thank you for your careful to say, stay standing for a minute, not because I want to elongate the standing ovation, well, maybe, uh, but, they, <laughs> but just give yourselves a little bit of a stretch. And um, the, the next is going to be experiential, um, so it'll be more physical moving and a little bit more um, you participating. Okay, I'll ask you to sit back down. I, I promised that I was going to do a guided visualization of the life of your dad that I think will allow you to do a paradigm shift about your dad and also the very concept of male privilege and male power that I sort of hinted at a little bit, but I want you to um, have a chance to apply this to yourself. So I'm going to ask you right now to just close your eyes, if you would, and visualize a time that your dad had what I'm going to call a glint in his eye, a sort of moment where he didn't feel like he was, you didn't feel like he was getting ready to criticize you for something you were doing wrong, that he was worried about any responsibility, a feeling he was just completely relaxed and happy. If you didn't know your dad, your dad disappeared from your life at an early age, you still have in your mind an, an imaginary, an imagination of what your dad probably was like then for this entire experience, use what is in your imagination because what's in your imagination is your relationship with your dad. So imagine whether your dad had that glint in his eye when he was you know, telling jokes. And he was, he was so relaxed because every, he had told that joke many times before and he knew that every time he told that joke, people would laugh and people would respect him and like him and bond with him for, for that joke that he had rehearsed. Or maybe telling a story, a story maybe that often hinted about how wonderful he was in some way. 
and you may have rolled your eyes, but for him this sort of created that glint in his eye because he knew everybody would respond positively to it. Maybe it's when he came back from skiing or fly fishing, or maybe your dad sang in a chorus, and when you noticed him singing in the chorus, he just seemed to have that glint in his eye of just totally connecting with God, connecting with himself, connecting with the rest of the choir, being in total sync um, with that rest of the chorus, and you knew that that's just what he loved to do. Maybe you saw your dad in a play, or he acted, or maybe he just acted at home and, um, in, in, a, in a sort of informal type of way, and you saw that glint in his eye at that point. Maybe he painted, and you, and you saw how happy he was when he was painting. Maybe he played a musical instrument or played in a band. Maybe he played with your children, and you noticed that when he was playing with your children, he wasn't so worried. He just could be more at abandon. He just seemed happier. You sort of wished he was that way when he played with you, but he wasn't because with you, he had responsibilities. With your, with your children, you had the responsibilities. Maybe he was loved flying in a small plane at sunset, watching the clouds as um, integrate with the, with the sun as it changed colors. Maybe he loved cooking dinner, turkey at, for the family dinner um, at Thanksgiving be, before he became a vegan. Um, <laughs> visualize, visualize what your dad, now just spend a second, raise your hand if you need more time to get a visualization of your dad with a glint in his eye. Okay, I think every, except for one person we have, take a little bit more time then to get that visualization of your dad when he had the greatest glint in his eye. Now, if the glint, for example, was your dad flying a plane, notice that, and then your dad became a pilot, you might be tempted to say, oh, my father did what created the glint in his eye. He loved flying with small aircraft and watching the, the sunset and, the, and that inspired him. He became a pilot, but he did just what he wanted to do. That what created the glint in his eye. Wrong. The, what created the glint in the eye about your dad being a pilot of a small plane was freedom, was the poetry of the sunset, of the connection to the art and the peace. As a pilot, your dad's mandate is FAA regulations, a schedule created by somebody else, and a dozen other responsibilities. If your dad's glint was cooking turkey for family dinner, you might say, oh, my dad does exactly what he wants to do. He's a chef. I'm challenging that. What was created the glint in your dad's eye by cooking turkey at family dinner during Thanksgiving is family, is cooking occasionally, not consistently. When he became a chef, he was cooking not for family but for strangers. He had to often be away from his family during Thanksgiving while he was cooking. So be careful about assuming that the glint is translated into a profession because most times when a glint gets translated into a profession, it becomes routine, it becomes rigid, it becomes um, filled with responsibilities. So distinguish carefully between the glint and the professional translation of that glint. I'm now going to be asking you to open your eyes. And in a moment, I'm going to ask you to get together in groups of three. Um, I think there are, yes. So I'm going to be asking you to get, as you get together in groups of three, to have two parameters on that group. Um, pull, um, it's going to be, so because it's a group of three, I'll ask you to pull the chairs away from the table and be in a tight knit circle, to the, a triangle. Um, second, I'm going to be asking you to get together with somebody you do in this room that you do not know. And third, I'm going to be asking you, if at all possible, to try to make sure there's at least uh, one person of the other gender um, in your group. So someone you don't know, group of three, away from the table, uh, triangular relationship, and somebody at, in that group um, who is a member of the other gender. Ready, get set. I'll ask you to move. Um,
What's that? Ah, four, 450. Uh, so yeah, it's going to be a little tight. Yes. Uh, sorry. Already right, hold for a moment. Is there anybody that needs any help in the creation of the group? I'm now going to be asking you to choose one, uh, find somebody in the group that has a watch either with a second hand or an iPhone with a timer and that knows how to use it. Um, and so if you have more than one person in your group, I'll ask you to choose the person to be a facilitator who has the greatest uh, facility at boundary enforcement. So, so who's ever a good boundary enforcer? Everybody chose Julie. I don't know why that was. <laughs> um, now, so, that so each group should now have a facilitator who has a watch in his or her hand. And I'm going to be asking you to allow each group member one minute, but at the end of 50 seconds, I'm going to be asking the facilitator to say 10 seconds is our left, and then to move on at the end of... Um, that the full minute to the next person in the group, I'm going to be asking you to answer, to tell your group two things. One is what your dad did for a living, uh, what, what your dad, what was the glint in your dad's eye and how you knew about that, what, what were the hints that told you about that, what that glint is, and then second, what your dad actually did for a living. So um, now, person who's a facilitator, I'm going to talk to you for a second. I'm going to ask you to look at the other two people in the group and start with the person who looks most mentally alert. <laughs> okay, facilitator, I think you probably found that person. Ready, get set, 50 seconds and then 10 for each person. Ready, get set, go. Enforce those boundaries, enforce those boundaries. little pieces of data together, somewhere in the 70, 80 percent uh, category. Yes. Ready, hold. I'm now going to ask you to look around your group and the person whose story most touched your heart, point to him ask, or her 
to ask her and maybe to raise their hand and to potentially share a story. We're only gonna have a chance to share one or two quickies because I'm at the end of um, my time before I want Troy to be able to go on. So um, point to somebody, somebody's being pointed to right here. Would you, would you stand up and, um, and come, come on up here to share this microphone. All right. Good. What is your name? Rich. Rich. Okay. Rich. Are, are these microphones working? Yes. Great. I think you can share that microphone. Oh, mine was a simple story, and I was telling a lot of it as my dad uh, had entered grandfatherhood, and when this the family was sitting around, but especially his grandkids, eating watermelon, they would be sitting at the table. And you could tell his world was all right because they liked watermelon, he liked watermelon, and they just sit there and he would bring more watermelon out and they would eat more watermelon. No one paid attention at any time or anything else, but it was really, and he was a police officer. And what did he do? Yes. And so he was a police officer. Police officer. officer. Mm -hmm. Yes. Very right. good of a hand. So th there aren't that many jobs of passing out watermelon at dinner time to your own family, right? <laughs> uh, one more person to do that. Yes, please. So she's gonna be sharing what the glint in my father's eye was and what my dad did for a living. Hi, what is your name? Lucia, Lucia, Lucia Luzondo. My dad's glimmer is captured in one photo taken December 25th, 1981, where his exact look of looking at me with such profound love and pride that would, take, that would make his eyes shine. And he was looking at the little girl that he knew in his heart that he was raising to become what he wanted to be and couldn't. My father just reached the third grade, had to quit uh, to work to sustain his family since the third, the third uh, grade, and he wanted to become a lawyer. He was a very legally wise man, and I became a lawyer. So that was his other day of glimmer, when he not only glimmered, but he cried when I swore in as a Florida attorney, and he was a commercial uh, equipment merchant. He sold ref commercial refrigeration equipment. Thank you. That was my dad. Thank you. So I, I hope that this will create a different experience of what men earning more was about. Yes, men did earn more, not for the same work, by the way, but for different types of work and different types of obligations. And more about that in a book called Why Men Earn More that I wrote that had to, that documented that piece. But for now, what I'd like us to know is that many of our fathers had a glint in their eye and two things happened. One is they knew that when they had children, that their job was not to do what created the glint in their eye, but rather to do whatever it took to be able to give their children more options than they had, which was exactly the same mandate as mom had. And so, and secondly, there's a little trick to this. When their daughter or their son took advantage of those opportunities and she also became an attorney, that was the second, that was the return of the glint in our dad's eye. Thank you. <laughs>